Welcome to the Big Money Questions show. I'm Rachel Rickard Strauss, personal finance editor at This Is Money. Today we're going to talk about why economists get it so badly wrong. Uh, we have Peter Antonioni with us here. He is the author of Economics for Dummies, and he's also a senior teaching fellow at the UCL School of Management. Um, let's straight away go in. Why do they get it so wrong? Number of reasons. First comes from what economics is as, uh, in, in and of itself, which is it's a toolkit for thinking mathematically and logically through problems about how things get made and who gets to buy them, mm -hmm. given that people trade with one another. So you start off from this. You have to use a lot of abstractions in order to make things make sense. And those abstractions have got to be quite forgiving because unless you walk around with a brain scanner or your Professor X, you don't actually know what another person is thinking the whole time. So you have to treat people as being quite abstract in this way. So models tend to be a very big simplification of human behavior. They don't count all of the complications, all of the nuances, all of those little complexities that make us us. Mm -hmm. So they have to aggregate in one way or another. And that means you can leave a lot out. So what kind of assumptions do we make about people? Well, there is a very simple set of assumptions that we call rationality. And I'm not sure I really like the word in general. I'll quickly say why, which is that it's actually it's a mathematical toolkit, not a psychological diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say anything about how loopy a person is or how centred they are or anything like that. It basically enforces rules that people's behaviour is consistent, uh, so, for example, if I prefer coffee to tea and tea to cocoa, I'll prefer coffee to cocoa. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that's in there. And, and with that it, if you prefer tea, best of all, you'll always have tea. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But if I'm preferring one to the other and the other to the other, I must prefer the first to the third. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of rule that's in, in um, the economist's conception of rationality. Note it doesn't say anything about how healthy you are psychologically or anything like that. And these are the fundamental assumptions that you have to do to make models. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is that people's behaviour could be perfectly rational in the psychological sense, but might not be treatable consistently in an economic sense, essentially because quite often we're all making it up as we go along. So economists have come up with a lot of ex-post justifications for this. One is that we don't actually behave like the rational model, we just act as if we do. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we don't actually go around weighing up all of the consequences of doing one thing above another. Yeah. It's just that once you've taken the decisions and whatever thought processes we've made, it's reasonable to go back afterwards and say, well, we might not have done it for those reasons, but we chose as if we did. Okay, that, that makes no sense at all to me. <laughs> well, it makes very little sense to some of us, which is why a lot of, uh, a lot of us are quite critical about how we're thinking about it now. Are people that weird, though, that you can't model uh, people's behaviour en masse like that? Well, that's the problem. I mean, people, you, c you can make f a few th uh, assumptions about it. So you can say that people are distributed in some sense or another, so the extremes will average out mm -hmm. when you're making out a model of some kind. Mm -hmm. Or you can actually just, you know, get away from the idea that a person is anything, which is what we do, and we just treat it as being what are the mathematical criteria you would do for use for making a decision and go from there. Okay. I'm just wondering how this feeds into some of the big things that we use economists for. Okay. So pick an example like GDP, GDP forecasting, so how much the economy is going to grow, or... Uh, consumer spending, how much we're going to be spending, or inflation, how much the price of stuff is going to go up. Okay. If this is all done through models, right? right. Well, so some of the time it's done through models, some of the time it's done through people making more um, ad hoc guesses, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's done through people trying to read what other people are doing and working out what their best guess of that is. So, for example, if there are a lot of predictions going around, I might be trying to figure out, well, what does the average prediction say? Not what's really going to happen. And then go for that. And go for so that. So you sort of hedge. You so don't... you sort of hedge. Okay. So you've got three possible, you know, things in there. Right. Um, so sometimes, okay, let's say the gold standard is that you actually do it from a model of some kind. Mm -hmm. There are um, 
I have to fall back on the famous saying from Yogi Berra that it's not easy to predict anything, especially not the future. Mm -hmm. And the thing about the future is it's uncertain. And the further away you go from today, the more uncertain the future is. So there's always going to be some uncertainty about what you say going forward. The second um, issue that you have there is that one of the problems we've found with our models is that they haven't been as reflective of reality as we'd like them to be. Uh, for example, the class of models that we used before the financial crisis, in widely used, um, a good many of them didn't model the financial sector at all. They left it entirely out as a simplifying assumption. Well, what kind of models were these, or what are they used for? They were used for predicting the, the state of the economy in the future, given things like people's preferences for saving over time, given uh, potential for interest rates moving, given what we knew about statistical relationships between those things in the past but they left out entirely the role of the financial sector, which turned out to be a pretty big omission. Mm. But the thing about, again, the thing about a model is it's a simplification of reality. It's not reality. So, for example, you know, I mean, uh, let's take a, an entirely different field. I mean, if you look at, you know, one of those Formula One cars, at some point somebody will have built a clay model of one of those cars and put it in an, uh, an aer aerodynamic testing chamber. And... They'll have looked at all of the air flows over the car. You can't drive one. It's a representation of a part of reality. So one of the things is models are sensitive to what you leave out. Mm. They're very sensitive to, uh, in, for example, in this case, uh, not thinking you know, straight about the behavior of the financial sector when we were modeling the, eco the economy as a whole. The way you present it then, it seems like an almost impossible task to, economics itself seems impossible, to be able to create models and use mathematics to, to make predictions about things far in the future, about people who are occasionally whimsical, seems almost impossible. So then what do we do? What do we use economics for? Do we come up with an alternative? Well, there's actually a few things to unpick there. I mean. One point is, yes, it is almost a whimsical and chaotic, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, e exercise, uh, you know. Um, so, it, so prediction going, you know, for things in the future is quite often a fool's game. Um, and it's, uh, it, you know, and that is because it's so difficult to do. However, people are still willing to pay for foresight, to look at people who've got decent mechanisms to argue why things might be the case. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the ways forward is instead of giving uh, estimates and confidence bounds, you actually are able to break down in very, very simple reasons why you think something is going to be the case. And I think having a mechanism is what really distinguishes you know, uh, economics practiced well from, say, something like astrology. Um, I don't want to be mean to astrologers because I'm sure that, they're, they're, that if you look long enough, you'll find correlations between star movements and, uh, and movements of an economy. But economists have got a standard for using the tools that they have, and they should be able to point out what the mechanisms they think are going on in that case. So that's point one. So d just to make sure I understand completely what you're saying, instead of saying something like, we believe that, uh, as the Bank of England has just said, we believe that instead of being 0.8% GDP growth as we thought previously, and then 1.4, we actually think 2%, what they should do is break down the reasons what why. are the reasons behind this. Absolutely. And then if you don't quite agree with a bit of the reasoning, then you can kind well, of... Well, you're, you're, you're completely free to accept can, a prediction or not. Yes, okay. I mean, um, it, it may well be that, uh, you know, if you took a sample of 100 economists, you know, you, you wouldn't, you'd find 101 different reasons for disagreeing with the, with the prediction. Mm -hmm. And that's because we're all trying to figure it out. Um, so that's part one of it. I mean, and a second thing is to realise that um, the state of our, act of, of our economy is literally the uh, product of the actions of millions of blind idiots. Mm -hmm. Really, none of us know about the future. We're all grasping in the dark when we're trying to predict things. So one of the things a model is kind of trying to do uh, implicitly, even though it's not doing so explicitly, is actually try to read the actions of all of those millions of blind idiots. 
and that's and a little bit of humility about that. That's that's a difficult task. Yeah. And then the final thing is that actually, well, yeah, there are techniques that are used in other areas of business planning that can uh, enhance the way we think about economics. And I'm quite a fan of scenario planning in general mm -hmm. because um, it's something that tries not to censor the things that eco economic models do censor. Um, so it tries to see, well, what if this is wrong, rather than uh, are you know, confidently pronouncing going forward. Okay. So perhaps you could talk us through how you would use scenario planning in a, in a particular uh, situation where you might use traditional economics instead. Okay, in general there's two parts of the process. The first is generating the scenarios and really one of the key things to do is to go around and get as many sources of information and opinion and factor those together. So you talk to people. Talk to people, okay. listen to people actually, mm -hmm. you know. That's probably more important than talking to people, is actually listening to them and finding out where the angles that they're coming from things are, because they might not be what you expect. The second part of the process is then to go around and actually present and take widely uh, your views on this and to try and see how that informs your contours of the world going forward. Um, so. For example, if I were doing uh, uh, an economic model, I would reduce things to a set of equations. I'm saying reduce to a set of equations, really. Some economic models have more than a thousand equations in them, so these things can be very complicated. What I would do with scenario planning is I would get rid of the equations and I would try to start getting what people's guesses were. And I'd be trying to factor in, well, how many of these are in the political sphere? How many of these are projections about how technology is going to develop? Mm -hmm. In other words, I'm doing a lot of things that economists might do when they're looking at one small piece of the problem, but not when they're creating a model. And instead of creating a model, what I'm doing is I'm creating different outcomes. What I then want to do is explore those outcomes. I want to feel them as living, breathing worlds and say, what's it like to live there? Mm -hmm. What things are going on? Um, how would I behave differently if this were the case than if something else were the case? Mm -hmm. So it's a very much wider way of looking at things. And I think that, you know, I don't think it's a substitute for economic models. I think they've got their place, and I think they're very good for building understanding. Yeah. But it forms a very nice complement to them. Could you do it, say, for the outcome of uh, post-Brexit? We could think about that in terms of different scenarios, yes. Mm -hmm. We could think about the scenario of a hard Brexit and what that would mean as a world to live in. Mm -hmm. We could think about the, and in fact, to some extent, if you look at press coverage, these are some of the things that people are obsessing over already, because there are different flavours of the future that will have different meaning. So we can essentially play out different scenarios. So we can say, well, what would happen if we had restrictions on, on immigration, but we um, had a smaller banking sector? Right. These and different permutations and say, if we had this one and that one, what would that look right. like? Right. And actually, when you're doing strategic work, this is actually much more the, the state of how you would look at things rather than relying simply on the model. Yeah. The model might tell you a lot of, uh, of good information, give you a lot of good intuitions, but as I say, it's a toolkit for understanding the world, it's not the world. So the two of them work qu in quite a complementary way. I'm wondering what people do who don't know a lot about economics, um, but are sort of reliant on economists to, to give forecasts on what's going to happen to things like interest rates and inflation. And they make their best guess, the same as all of us do. Yeah. Um, some of us make the best guess for, that we can from a lot of information. Some of us do it based on very little and just a little bit of you know, sense about what we're doing. That's one of the reasons why perhaps you know, people might not behave in the way that an economist thinks is optimal, but they make doing something perfectly sensible because they don't have that same set of information. Mm -hmm. But as I said, it's all the action of millions of blind idiots. We're all grasping at the future that we don't entirely know. So, you know, all of us are making our best guesses and trying to figure things out. Yeah. It does seem like a little bit of a, a crisis at the moment in, in economics in terms of, of uh, people looking back and thinking, well, hang on, you didn't see that coming, and you didn't see that coming, and well, we're not quite sure about that one. Well, you and see, so there are enough people practicing in the world that somebody saw it coming. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of, um, I mean, there are, are a lot of people looking at things from very, very different perspectives within economics. 
The crisis in economics and in economics teaching and in the economics curricula is you know, probably the subject of a whole day's worth of interviews in and of itself. Um, there's been a lot of soul searching that's gone on and the, there's been a lot of uh, criticism of the economics curriculum uh, you know, and in, in particular. So there, there are a lot of aspects to this. Um, but it's probably true that some economists did make predictions that weren't heard. Some made predictions that were heard but dismissed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a much broader spectrum of people that are actually involved in economics as a profession, if it is one, um, than, than you know, the narrow view that we sometimes get, that it's only done by these people and these people. Yeah. So and there seem to be different factions as well. The one that's gaining momentum is, is behavioural uh, econ absolutely who um, uh, seem to have found their place by acknowledging and accepting that people are different, they don't necessarily conform to these models, and we have to take all of that into consideration as well. Well, that's, what, that's another aspect of it. There are people, and they do, do a lot of experiments to see how, for example, framing a a problem in a different way leads to a different solution or mm -hmm. you know or how we don't behave according to the you know strict rationality of the economic model yeah. um, and that's valuable then there are others who are doing it on from an evolutionary basis and they're looking at things over the sweep of history and they're saying you know why is it that some companies survive or why is it that some patterns keep re-emerging. Mm -hmm. There are others who are looking very, very specifically at the function of different types of markets and looking for those types of question. Like many um, fields of academic enterprise, economics has got very, very specialised over time. I wouldn't know what people who are other economists you know, are, are doing necessarily because their work has taken so far away from anything I've been doing. Mm -hmm. So this is quite, uh, you know, this is part of and parcel of increasing specialisation that we've had in many fields, and it makes it difficult to connect all the all the dots in yeah. the end. That's a shame, isn't it, that you'll have people discovering and, and thinking about really useful things uh, in not quite isolation, but it doesn't sound like there's the conversation in the same way to uh, to cross fertilise all these different ideas. Well, this is a, a this is a problem, you know, and not and it's not just economics. This is a problem with a lot of areas that are research heavy, is that you have to be very specialised to solve the next problem. But you you know sometimes it's the hyphens, the people who are connect up individual areas that are actually quite important, mm -hmm. and they can can get sidelined. They don't necessarily. I mean, there are you know, situations where it works really well. But some of the time, you know, it, 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 there will be incentives to specialise in various ways. And as a result, you don't really quite get that, yeah. that across-the-board knowledge. Okay. So it sounds like we should cut them a bit of slack because it's a tough job to try and predict the future. Oh, absolutely. Um, but that also there's more work to be done in terms of um, thinking broadly about how we answer those questions that we do with, in economics. Exactly. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you, thank you for joining us for the big money questions.